Hello everyone and welcome to a presentation on employee experience in the GI unit sponsored by the American Society for Gastrointestinal Endoscopy. My name is Eden Essex and I will be the moderator for today's call. Our presenter for today's call is Nancy Schlossberg who is a digestive health consultant with John Muir Health in Walnut Creek, California. Nancy has been a gastroenterology and endoscopy nurse for more than three decades, filling a variety of staff, management, business development, and leadership roles. Her broad clinical and programmatic business background in the development of GI and endoscopy service lines includes designing consulting tools for benchmarked and best practiced analyses on GI reprocessing, efficiency, repair reduction, and quality for hospital and ambulatory settings. Nancy is a past president of SGNA and currently serves as president-elect of the American Board of Certification for Gastroenterology Nurses. Nancy served on the ASGE Endoscopy Unit Quality Indicator Task Force and is one of the leading authors of the task force paper, Quality Indicators for Gastrointestinal Endoscopy Units, which was published in Video GIE. Our presenter has disclosed the following relationship. It has no bearing on today's presentation. I will now hand the presentation over to our presenter, Nancy Slosberg. So good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining today's webinar. The webinar today has three key objectives. First, it will outline the objectives of the ASGE Endoscopy Unit Quality Indicator Task Force. That is, what did we want to accomplish? What did the task force want to accomplish? And second, the presentation will describe the work the task force has accomplished to date, in particular, how it generated potential endoscopy unit quality indicators and reached consensus on them. Third, we'll drill down a little more and share the results from our work on employee experience indicator as just one example of the indicators that were considered to be markers of a high quality endoscopy unit. So what is quality? As with any topic, it is important to have an understanding of what we are talking about. There are a number of definitions of quality, and this is the one that I think best captures the meaning. Quality of care is the degree to which health services for individuals and populations do two things. First, increase the likelihood of desired health outcomes, and second, are consistent with current professional knowledge and clinical evidence. Over the past few decades, Thank you. Over the past few decades, there's been a tremendous focus on quality in medicine. Ideally, we would like our clinical practice to provide evidence-based and patient-centered care for all of our patients. However, in medicine, we have learned that there is variation in which providers practice. Many decisions are based on intuition, and there is inadequate patient involvement. As a result, a quality chasm has developed between what our ideal is and what we are actually doing. It is trying to bridge and narrow this chasm where much of the quality work has been focused in GI and endoscopy over the last several years. Next slide, please. So why is this important? Why the big focus on quality and in the endoscopy unit? There are several re reasons, which include a quality show leads to more satisfied patients and providers, greater case volume and physician recruitment to use the facility, higher revenues for the institution, and reduced errors. As we continue to see in the news, poor quality and safety problems in an endoscopy unit can be catastrophic. Finally, payers are watching. But in the end, patients remain the biggest potential driver. Next slide, please. Thank you. Significant multi-society efforts have been dedicated to defining, developing, refining, and implementing what constitutes a high-quality endoscopic procedure. Guidelines were developed that focused on indicators and provided perform performance targets. With these guidelines, people now measure and have demonstrated improvement. These efforts have been helpful in promoting best practices among endoscopists and providing evidence-based care for our patients. We have seen that variation exists on a number of important indicators of quality endoscopy. A critical component of high quality endoscopy service, services relates to the site of the procedure, the endoscopy unit. And I'm sure all of us can agree that there is variation in endoscopy units. A small study published a few years ago highlighted variation in our infection control practices. Large lapses were noted in areas of hand hygiene, safe injection practices, and endoscope reprocessing. 
We also have notable examples in the press like the 2008 hepatitis C outbreak in the Nevada Endoscopy ASC. Unlike many procedure-associated quality indicators, evidence-based indicators used to measure the quality of our endoscopy units in the United States are lacking. With the success of the quality indicators for procedures and that there is variation seen in endoscopy units, this was our starting point. This is what we used uh, to begin our work in developing endoscopy unit quality indicators. Given this focus on improving quality in endoscopy units, uh, the, the Government National Quality Forum GI and GI societies share a high interest in developing endoscopy unit related quality measures. As a result, an ASGE task force was launched in 2013 to define endoscopy unit specific quality indicators. There were three objectives of this task force. First, explore the literature to date on the subject. Next, to define and propose endoscopy unit quality indicators. And finally, to guide the research needed in this area. Next slide, please. This slide gives us a very high level overview of the work of the task force over the last three years. The task force itself included a diverse membership of 16 members, physicians and nurses, most of whom had endoscopy unit leadership experience. So let's discuss the first phase of the project and how the task force developed the quality indicators. Five subgroups were identified and covered the areas of patient experience, employee experience, operations management and efficiency, procedure related and safety, and infection control. Each of these subgroups were then divided, were then tasked with two goals. One, to review and examine the literature on their specific domain, and two, to generate potential endoscopy unit quality indicators for that domain. From this work, a large number of potential endoscopy quality indicators were developed. In fact, there were 155 in all developed. The second phase of the project established a process for how to reach consensus on which indicators to include in the final guidelines. We decided to use a modified Delphi method. The goal of the Delphi method is to measure two main parameters for consensus. Number one, the extent to which respondents agreed with the importance and relevance of a potential quality indicator. And number two, the extent to which respondents agreed with each other. In the Delphi method, selected groups were sent a survey in which there were two rounds of voting, in which, again, indicators were scored. They were scored on relatedness to the indicator to, of the indicator to quality, the meaningful, the mean, is it meaningful to measure, is it feasible to measure, and the compliance by the respondents unit in terms of are you currently measuring it. These invited groups were very diverse. They included ASGE Endoscopy Unit Recognition Program members, SGNA Regional Presidents, and members of the Quality Committees for ASGE, AGA, and ACG. 85% of the respondents strongly agreed with indicators after two rounds of voting. The overall survey response rate for both the first and second round of voting was 22% with the greatest response rate in the domains of employee experience and efficiency and operations. Next slide, please. Here is a list of the priority endoscopy unit quality indicators identified by the task force. First, ensuring that a defined leadership is in place helps to promote high performance leadership, which helps efficiency and operations of the endoscopy unit and advances staff experience. Second, promoting education and training among staff and endoscopists stimulates professional development, but also helps to ensure that patients undergoing endoscopic procedures are receiving high quality and safe care. Third, complementing training and education, it is important to not only provide feedback to staff, but to also track quality indicators for endoscopists and regularly share this data with them. Communication with patients and referring providers about a patient's care within the endoscopy unit helps foster a more patient-centered environment, thereby improving the patient experience and improving transitions in care. And finally, embedded within a high-quality endoscopy unit is a culture of safety and high standards for infection control. Central to this theme are practices and policies, as well as monitoring related to endoscope reprocessing. 
Before we focus on the work of the employee experience subgroup and employee experience as an important indicator of endoscopy unit quality, let's take a look at the conclusions of the entire study. First, little information on performance variation exists. Next, there is no current organizational frame framework by which endoscopy units can direct their quality efforts. And this is the first study to identify U.S. endoscopy unit quality indicators using the Delphi method in which we examined the five broad domains. 155 initial quality indicators were developed and five priority quality indicators were identified. The study also aimed to guide endoscopy units in their, in their efforts to assess and improve quality. Next slide, please. So, now let's talk about the employee experience domain. Although patient satisfaction is well accepted as a quality metric in medicine, employee experience has been less well explored. In healthcare, the link between employee experience and patient satisfaction ultimately affects the quality of patient care. Next slide, please. Existing literature in the healthcare and non-healthcare industries, including research published by well-known organizations such as Gallup and Prescini, demonstrates a direct and positive relationship between patient or customer experience and employee engagement and performance. Much of the literature on employee experience in healthcare has examined promoting high-level leadership practices, having a strong relationship with and support from managerial staff, organizational commitment, work content that is valued by the employee, and workplace environment. For example, Gallup research has found that that the top 25 best managed teams versus the bottom 25% or worst managed team in any workplace have nearly 50% fewer accidents and have 41% fewer quality defects. Furthermore, teams in the top 25% versus the bottom 25% incur far less in healthcare costs. So having too few engaged employees means our workplaces are less safe, employees have more quality defects, and disengagement, which is ultimately driving up healthcare costs. Unfortunately, to date, there are limited studies that identify specific indicators measuring employee experience in GI and endoscopy unit settings in the United States. So, what did our study demonstrate? Next slide, please. The employee experience domain included a great many subdomains from the vantage point of the workers in the endoscopy unit. There were 33 potential endoscopy unit quality indicators that were originally developed by the expert consensus in the employee experience domain. The domain was further subdivided into areas that covered employee feedback, performance evaluation, and training. And you can read those, yeah. So, initially, 10 of these indicators that were proposed met our consensus threshold. Six indicators highlighted in, in the white on the previous slide and in the white paper were deemed most important. The top six quality indicators in the employee experience domain deemed most important were providing education on new equipment and techniques, training, which should be competency-based and based on sta staff feedback, and the use of team training. Staff should feel empowered to raise concerns. Number five, staff receives individualized evaluation. And finally, in keeping with the theme of teams, there should also be ongoing staff meetings. Next slide, please. Several themes emerged, uh, several themes emerged among the top-rated six quality indicators for employee experience. For example, half of these indicators underscored the important relationship between training and overall employee experience. Respondents agreed that endoscopy units should provide regular education programs and continuous quality improvement for all staff on new equipment and devices and endoscopic techniques using tools such as checklists and team training. Furthermore, this training should be competency-based, modified in response to staff feedback, and provided by competent trainers. One-third of the six indicators valued the importance of employee feedback. In this arena, respondents thought that high-quality endoscopy units should foster a culture wherein staff feel empowered to raise concerns about the safety and quality of the endoscopy unit and that there were formal staff meetings. Finally, one indicator reflected the importance of performance evaluations and formalized goal settings for employees. 
Next slide, please. Interestingly, many employee experience indicators were not deemed feasible to measure. Also, one third of respondents indicated that they were non-compliant with many of the proposed employee experience indicators. Areas were less, where, where units were less compliant included several leadership functions, such as tracking data, employee recognition, employers receive results of employee surveys, and this data is acted upon. And this is where I have to stop and ask, do we not place enough value on growing our leaders and giving them the time to develop engaged teams and tools? This non-compliance highlights areas that might serve you as a starting point in your unit today and where much work might be focused in the future. Next slide, please. After both rounds of voting were complete, research questions were generated by each subgroup and then reviewed and unanimously agreed upon by the steering committee. Those generated by the employee experience subgroup included, is there a correlation between employee experience and other measures in endoscopy unit quality? Is there a relationship between the quality of the education and quality outcomes, like education on endoscope reprocessing and subsequent compliance with all steps? Is there a relationship between physician attitudes and the overall quality of the endoscopy unit? What are ways to improve compliance for education and training quality indicators that are rated as meaningful and feasible? What are important opportunities for leadership and pro professional growth in the endoscopy unit? And how effective are efforts to enhance staff satisfaction and training in improving patient satisfaction and other procedure outcomes? So again, just looking at these research questions and reflecting back on the indicators that respondents found difficult to comply with or not feasible to measure can provide opportunities to make improvements today. For example, investing in leadership is a really good place to start. Next slide, please. So great managers build healthy teams, and leadership comes from and starts at the top. Great endoscopy unit nurse managers build healthy teams and measurably great places to work, as you can see from this endoscopy unit employee engagement survey. On a scale of five, four, this, this unit received a 4.88 out of five. These employees didn't just come to work to put in their hours and pick up a paycheck. You can see they feel valued, their opinions count, they have the equipment and education they need, and they know what's expected of them in order to competently and confidently deliver excellent patient care. Next slide, please. GI and endoscopy units must create programs and incentives that increase retention. We're all familiar with the incentives tied to money, such as competitive salaries and benefits, profit sharing, scholarships, and tuition reimbursement. Hospitals that achieve magnet status have higher rates of nurse retention due to job satisfaction. But how about achieving ASGE unit recognition for your endoscopy unit? What is it that makes it personal for an endoscopy unit? Endoscopy units that promote continuing education and encourage an appreciative and respectful working environment tend to retain nurses. Your very best employees will want to know the full scope of advancement opportunities available to them, such as types of training and development activities and leadership opportunities they can expect in the future. Treating employees fairly and demonstrating appreciation and respect go a very long way. A simple thank you or administrators, as I say, hanging out in the unit, just seeing what's going on and, get, and taking the temperature go a long way to making employees feel appreciated. Next slide, please. Frequently thanking employees has a positive impact on employee retention. Conversely, Employers who seldom or never thank their employees are at risk of losing employees. In this survey, nearly 80% surveyed considered 22 intangible rewards like verbal and written, written praise extremely or very important. Only 25% of employees who received recognition on a frequent basis said they would consider leaving. Next slide, please. Finally, have fun, celebrate success. GI Nurses Week, for example, is a great time to combine food, education, and celebration of your team. Here is a list of many activities that promote employee engagement. You can see off-site activities, volunteer projects, recognition board, as I say, walls of fame, put people's pictures up on the wall. 
again, March is colorectal cancer awareness month, birthdays, holidays, potlucks, all things to have fun and celebrate success. Excellent. So our current study provides one of the first attempts to identify quality indicators as they pertain to employee experience in the endoscopy unit and builds on many of these key concepts noted in the literature. Key indicators identified through our approach highlight the importance of staff empowerment through meetings, ongoing performance evaluation, training that is continuous, team-based, and modified on the basis of staff feedback. These are essential to track, measure, trend, and improve on within the endoscopy unit. By measuring employee experience, an endoscopy unit can better understand and implement strategies to improve employee and therefore patient experience and thus the overall quality of the unit. By applying the same principles of quality improvement using data on endoscopy unit performance, we can improve endoscopy patient and procedure related outcomes. Next slide, please. It's difficult to translate attitudes, feelings, and state of mind into profits, productivity, safety, and quality. However, clearly enhancing employee experience must be factored into what makes a quality endoscopy unit. Enhancing employee experience results in a great place to work. Improved staff retention, less absenteeism, team communication, and greater patient satisfaction. So now I'll pass the presentation back to Eden, and we can open the floor for any questions. And I hope that was enjoyable, and I hope that you go back and start looking at how you, you, you and your employees take care of one another to promote uh, patient satisfaction. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Much, Nancy. And on screen here, you will see that is the link to the video a GIE article that Nancy has been speaking to. Um, you will find a handout of the slides in this panel on the sidebar. You'll see it says Handouts 1, and you can download a PDF of this slide today, um, slide deck today. At this time, Nancy will address questions received from the audience. As a reminder, you can submit a question through the question box. If you do not see the question box, please click on the white arrow in the orange box located on the right side of your screen. It will be towards the bottom. And Nancy, our first one, wow, gets right at the heart of culture in the unit. So um, in this unit, they're working towards building a, a, a culture where the staff feel empowered to raise concerns, as you had pointed out. But there's one physician that kind of is working counter to the culture they're trying to develop. Do you have any advice or any strategies you can offer for approaching this physician or um, kind of, of helping these folks along in terms of building that culture where staff feels empowered to, to voice concerns openly? That's a fabulous question, and it's the same thing as, you know, sometimes the one person who puts the kibosh on, theme, on things ruins it for the whole team. I think as, as your team gets stronger, you get around that kind of position. They sort of get on board. And I don't know about the age of the physician, how long they've been there, if it's their, if it's their center. There's a lot of other factors that play into how to kind of get around that. And without knowing that, it, it, it's tough to answer it. But I, I think in the end, a team culture, when you're one for all and all for one, eventually trumps, the, as I want to say, the one bad apple. Um, but happy to, to take that question offline with a, with a couple more details. Okay, wonderful. Thanks, Nancy. And we have another question here. In terms of um, educating um, your staff and training point, are there any resources that you in particular would recommend, given your experience? Yeah, it depends what you're trying to educate them on. If it's, if it's a procedure and it's new equipment, um, I think it's always important to get the, the vendor involved, make sure they come in with competency-based training. But as, as, and it depends if you're learning a total new procedure for everybody or if you're bringing on board a new staff member as far as orientation. But any time that you're, you're looking at a new procedure, especially for example, it's really important to get the physicians in there to kind of do team training and to see what it's like. Because there's nothing like, and, and I think all of you on the line will probably attest to the fact that bad communication or lack of communication always comes up with a bad result. But if 
the physicians weren't learned in one place and the staff learned in another and they've never really put the two together it's a setup for taking for taking longer and potentially having bad outcomes so use your vendor and if it's a new staff member coming on for example and it's orientation again use your vendor and I'll go back to um, scope reprocessing for example and I think even though everybody goes, oh, we all do our competencies all year long, if you're a new staff member, it's nice to get the vendor to come in and actually walk you through, even if you're just in charge of doing the pre-cleaning piece of that. Make sure, they have con yeah, make sure they have competencies, that they come in with a list of competencies, because as a manager, it, it's really hard to, re there's, sometimes it's no fun to reinvent the wheel. And sometimes when I look at new equipment, and I look at new devices, the one of the first things I ask is show me your competency big sheet. Um, so that, that's always a good way to start. Wonderful. And while we're waiting for more questions to come in, I'll take the, uh, the, liber the, the liberty of asking you one myself, Nancy, knowing your breadth of experience. So thinking about training and, and maybe some the the non-technical skills and kind of the softer skills, if you, how do you, how have you in your experience identified future unit leaders and what kind of training and resources have you um, kind of pushed them towards to maybe get them on the track to be a future manager? Well, that's, that's another good question. And sometimes it depends on the system that you work for. Um, one of the bigger health systems I work for put an enormous amount of time and training into their into their leadership. Um, they we had to take courses on I don't want to say finance, but certainly on how to read a budget or a spreadsheet because nurse managers, uh, especially endoscopy nurse managers, um, don't really get that, and they expect you to be able to like well do, don't you understand your productivity or whatever else it is. So sometimes systems put a great deal of emphasis on educating their leaders and training their leaders because it just works out better for everybody in the end. Others, um, not so much. The courses kind of exist, but you have to ask for them or you have to hope that your manager or supervisor will say, yes, take a course on the outside. At the moment, if you buzz onto the SGNA website, there is, an, uh, there is a course, of, um, an online course on leadership. And I think it's really um, in, important to kind of look at that because then you're speaking the language when your administrators come to you and they go, blah, 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 blah. You really understand the language. And it, at the very least, one of the things that, although it seems kind of silly and you go, oh, yeah, I know how to do that, is to kind of understand how to work an Excel spreadsheet. And you can get very basic, add, subtract, multiply, and divide, but just understand how to set up a spreadsheet and how to read a spreadsheet. Wonderful. So let's let me ask a question at the other end of that. You know, we were talking about how the engaged employees make the workplace really less safe, um, and and these people can often be disruptive to your processes. So, what are some strategies you use to bring people around to a level of engagement, or um, maybe help them visit the door if they're really becoming um, disruptive to the workplace? Yeah, that's a nice way, and I'll put it I'll put it a nicer way. Especially, there's a lot of people who have been endosc in endoscopy for a very long time, and they're fabulous endoscopy nurses. They have great skills, whatever. But be it you know the disruptor of let's say electronic medical records, or a new physician who comes to town who's doing all these crazy procedures that you've never done before, and I've never done it that way, and I don't want to do it that way. I like the way it was before. Sometimes it's just not the right fit anymore. It's not that that you're any worse of a nurse or anything like that. So you really have to help people face that and say it's just not the right place for you anymore. And that's when it's really nice to have an HR department that will kind of uh, help you set up measurements and things that on a yearly basis, whatever your evaluation intervals are, to just kind of set up, let's see, what are measurable goals that we want to get to next time? And if you're not there, why aren't you there? You know, you're a fabulous nurse. You know how to do every single procedure here. You can, you know, do whatever. But sometimes people are just, it's just no longer the right fit. And that's, that's the problem that you have to get to with your employee, kind of bring them so that they make that decision themselves. And would that same kind of, those strategies hold through for techs, I'm assuming, as well? Or do you ever employ different strategies with the techs? Uh, techs are a different ball game, um, in in a sense, because in many places, although I think the tech is the, probably one of the, the the 
the most undervalued link in any team. In many places, there's no place, there's no pathway for tech advancement. And I think you can help techs along by either some of the, some of the really good techs I know have actually gone back to nursing school and they're the best endoscopy nurses going because they know both sides of the fence. But I think with them is to promote certification among techs, especially if they're the reprocessing techs, it's very important. Um, SGNA has uh, a, a, a recognition, a tech recognition course, but just to give them something that's theirs that shows how important they are. And um, just from my own personal experience, and when I talk about putting up people's pictures on walls and things like that, all my techs had gone through SGNA unit recognition. And we just had all of their certificates up. We had their pictures up on the wall. And when the Joint Commission came to call, and they said, so how do you know you're reprocessing your scopes? I was able to say, because our techs have taken this extra step. Um, and here you can see it. And they did not walk in. They did not really walk too much into that reprocessing room, because they go, ah, oh, these techs, we've, we've given them something else a little bit more than just the tech coming to work. But it, it means a whole lot for techs to, to be appreciated, and not appreciating them can have very, very dire consequences. So I think there's some easier things to do with techs, but again, because oftentimes there's no path, uh, there's no path on a tech. You can have a tech one, a tech two. It's just not to take your techs for granted. Thank you, Nancy. And we have a couple of questions coming in here. Um, the first is, what is the most important strategy, in your opinion, when rolling out a new program or a new procedure for staff to learn? I think that's a great question. First, you have to, you know, explain to everybody why you're doing it. Is this just off the wall? You know, why are we doing this? Is this part of a, of, of a bigger picture? So, um, and I'll, I'll use um, the introduction of endoscopic ultrasound. How do you introduce that? There's a ton of new equipment, and there's a ton of new, new devices, and there's a, you know, different ways to, to look at how you set up your room, for example. So again, it, it's a question of sitting down with your team and having a back and forth, because obviously there's going to be concerns. Some people are going to say, I don't think this is for me. Some people are going to jump right into it. And, but just to understand where you're coming from. And if you have, for example, another good example is, are, you, are we going to have a team to do advanced endoscopic procedures? But it's all about communication. And communication in this case often involves the physician coming in and being part of the team to go, how are we going to grow? How are we going to put this together? This is what I need. And again, you don't want you know, to go, well, what are we doing today? It's setting up the, a calendar of expectations, as I would say. So this is how we're going to start. The equipment comes this day. The trainers are coming this day. This is how we're going to train. And as you train, make sure that you leave a whole lot of time to train. Um, it's just not, you know, if, if you're running on various shifts, you can't go, okay, the training is at 8 o'clock on Tuesday for everybody. Well, that's not going to work. So you have to figure out creative ways to get everybody trained so that they feel comfortable and competent. And anytime you bring in anything new, it is always nice to have food and fun at the end of the day. And it's always nice, especially if you're bringing in a new procedure that's going to be part of a new program, to have time to decompress at the end of the day. It's like, well, you know, the plus delta. What worked? What didn't work? What hints can you give? What did you do during your training that made it so much easier to do? So again, it's all about communication. And when things fail, it is often about communication. It's the easy stuff, but that's the hardest stuff sometimes. Can't see that you don't get through the forest through the trees. Great. And our next question is, what is the number one thing a GI leader should do for their staff engagement? Oh, communicate. And, you know, if you have, for example, Gallup, where they kind of divide it out, um, and they say, you know, they'll make it. Like, do, do you have the tools? Do you have the time? Do you have whatever? It's really um, to, to ask staff, what do you need? Um, just to, to sit down and just go back and forth because you may think one thing, but they may completely say, well, that's not really what we need. What we really want is we, we really want in-services or we want a staff meeting on a regular basis because oftentimes what happens, you get so caught up in the day-to-day -day that staff meetings go away. And so just in saying, here's, a, here's our regular staff meeting. This is when it's going to be. It's going to be the first Monday of every single month. And just, you know, so there's an expectation there that here's the time we can communicate. Because I think lack of communication, and I, I've said it before, 
Um, the other thing is, as, as a nurse manager, if you're going to be a leader, always have your door open and don't whisper in front of other people. People do not like shut doors. You also have to treat people fairly. And just take a look at how, you know, you're giving, what, what is your, what is, what is, how do you give people off, you know, for Washington's birthday and Christmas and things like that, just to be fair across the board. Um, again, a uh, pot of chocolate works well, that people feel like they can come into your office and talk to you and that they're being treated fairly and they're not going to be looking and going, well, she called the other one over there. They're getting little advantages over me. People look at how, at how you lead. Um, the other thing is, if you're in a if you're in a position that you're as I call a working manager, where you go into procedures as well, go into procedures. Be be in other people's shoes. Um, you know, you may not be I may not be a great U.S. person, but I can certainly do keep keep your own competencies up and take a look because it's nice to be the leader. If you have to step in, if you're working in the surgery center, do you know how to schedule? What happens if your scheduler goes away? Be the receptionist sometime and just see what happens when patients walk in and you can really get a good feel for what's going on in there. So again, just really communicating and being figuring out what, what is it that I would like if, if I were the person working here, how would I like to be treated? And as the slide said, I know it sounds ridiculous, but just remembering to say thank you at the end of the day or for anything job well done is great. There's all sorts of ways to do appreciation boards and things like that, but it all gets down to sort of an open communication where people feel very comfortable. And our next question is, what do you do when you have challenging employees and you can't show them the door? <laughs> uh, you know what, I am gonna like, it is very difficult. I think that's, again, when you get into HR and making sure that among the other things you can't you're not just coming to work and getting a paycheck anymore part of the things you get measured against is kind of how you get along with other people um, and just make you know make measurable goals you have to you can't wimp out on this you, you got to face it and you have to sit people down and say if it doesn't improve in this amount of time and put people on performance improvement plans and I know you know you think you go well you're not nice well, what does that mean? Well, that means that you have staff members that will not work with you, or I have physicians who are coming to me and saying, I, I'm not working with that person. It just brings the whole tenor of the room down. And the sad thing is that often employees step right into it, and it's horrible to say that you kind of catch them in it, but all of a sudden realize that there are some red rules, some things that you just cannot do when you're taking care of patients. Um, Violating HIPAA is a good one, and oftentimes I find that em employees don't realize it, but they do it, but that's sort of symptomatic of, no, you can't talk about Mrs. Smith in the elevator and someone overheard you, and that is a red rule in the whole place, bye. Um, so you just, again, have to set up, you want to have something that's measurable, and then you want to, you have to face it and bring these folks in for, for some sort of a discussion on my, you know, I have people that don't want to work with you, or. And, or you know, physicians, people, a patient complained about you. So we'd lo we'd love you to stay, but we've got to see some improvement in these areas. And this is what I want to see. You've got six months. You know, you're on improvement plan for three months, for six months. And at, at some point, these kind of employees they get it, um, but they they don't really get it. But they improve enough so that they'll be team players, or they will leave, or you'll catch them in something. Well, our next question has you pulling out your crystal ball here, so I hope you've, you've polished it, Nancy. <laughs> what is your prediction for GI departments in the next five to ten years? What is it that you see coming in the GI future? You know, we were just talking about this a, a couple minutes ago, um, as it turned out. And obviously, we're seeing a lot of things going to surgery centers. We're seeing a lot of screening that we used to call our bread and butter in hospitals going into surgery centers. And I think there's a role for people who you know, work very well in surgery centers. These screening, it's great um, being able to expand your education and being able to work with the patient. Um, on the inpatient side, and it's funny, this is what we were just talking about, I, I think there's going to be a very big role for um, procedures, non-interventional or less interventional procedures through scopes, so all the notes stuff, 
that we used to go, ooh, this is like fantasy land that you could do all this stuff through the scope, but you're sure seeing it in bariatrics now um, and a lot of other things. So there is going to be a role, I think, for advanced procedure nurses in endoscopy because these procedures are getting more and more precise and longer and um, more difficult, requiring a lot of a lot of know-how and skills. And again, we get back to communication because you don't want to like be fumbling for things when you get into these advanced procedures. Um, so. I think there's a lot of, uh, I think a role that GI nurses don't have and haven't taken is being a nurse practitioner for, for GI endoscopy. Some of the advanced stuff, thinking about using, using your brain and really expanding what you know because GI nurses need to know a whole lot of things about a whole lot of, about people skills, um, procedure skills, uh, all sorts of communication skills with physicians, just sort of lia liaison, liaising. Um, they know anatomy, so I think people going back to get advanced degrees as advanced as, as in advanced nursing and nurse practitioners. I, I think you're going to see that because physicians are are busy. They need sort of that mid level of, of people to keep them in procedure rooms if that's what they if that if that's what they want to do. And there's just some stuff you know. Years ago, nurses couldn't take blood pressure. Um, years ago, uh, nurses nurses did, and they didn't do flex sigs. So we're going to see what's going to happen with some of this screening stuff as well as we go forward. Wonderful, wonderful. And, you know, just looping back to uh, the advice you gave on the challenging employees, um, the question, the person who asked the question just wanted to say great advice. Thank you. And we, of <laughs> course, all thank you. Um, she says she'll be watching for the other catch, and that was much appreciated. So, uh, so thank you, Nancy, for that. But while we're waiting for other questions to come in, you know, you talk about having, you know, a formal staff meeting, maybe the first of the month. Are there common um, elements of those staff meetings? Do you have standing agenda items, Nancy, or how, how do you structure, how do you think those should be structured? Yes, you should always have an agenda, and there should always be quality, should always be a topic that's on there, whether it's, you know, uh, patient, patient satisfaction, or even educating people to, like, oh, you know, what are physicians looking at as far as what is a quality colonoscopy? And because you're a part of that team, and there's all sorts of studies that show, for example, that um, having a nurse in the procedure room, when you have nurses looking for polyps with the physicians, the, the adenoma, the, the, the rate is more. They'll find more polyps when you've got some good trained eyes on it. But if you don't know if that feedback loop doesn't get closed, and you never really talk about the quality of what the physicians are doing, um, it, it, it doesn't work. Because again, it's, it, it is a team effort on that. And the end of the day, I keep saying you could be the person attached to the other end of the scope. So we always had an agenda. Quality comes up on it, equipment, um, you know, and then there's a little time for other, other issues. But it is important, and I think another piece to put on there, I know it's in some senses it might sound hokey, is recognition. It's like, you know, uh, just go around and, and say, what, what have we done in here? Just really celebrate your successes. And sometimes if you don't, like, put them up there and list them, people, people don't realize all the good that they've done and where, where they've gone and where they've come from. But if you have, especially in quality, if you start doing, if you pull out little QI measures that you've done, um, I, you know, from, from anything, um, I'm trying to think of, there's, there's physician ones in efficiency, um, uh, such as, you know, as, as our length of procedure of patient stay gone down and how have we contributed to that? And look, last, last time it took the patients two and a half hours from door to door and we've really, we've made it, we've made a difference. We've gone down to two hours and 15 minutes. But just having measurable, measurable goals and then showing them people, having, or showing them to your staff, having a report card, it's really good. And share that report card with physicians because sometimes they don't realize everything that goes into turning over a room, for example. But just show them we have made a difference and this is what we've, what we've got to do. But a standing agenda because you always know what you're getting in that. And again, it's all about setting expectations for staff. You need to know when you come to work that you're going to be in a safe place where people stand behind you, where you have the tools and resources to do what you need to do. And at the end of the day, you go home and you feel like I've taken some great care of patients and they've been safe, I've, I've had quality outcomes. And I think the biggest measure is I would go there or I would send my mother or father or somebody there. 
Wonderful. Well, um, I'll just give a moment here to see if anyone has any other questions, and I'll just tease another um, thread so people can start typing if they wish to. Uh, one of the things you, you mentioned was the endoscopy unit recognition program, Nancy, and, and you're talking about recognition but also team building. Do you find that that application process or, or maybe SGNA's Infection um, Prevention Champions Program, can those be really team activities that the unit can do and get recognition as well? Um, I absolutely think so because when you look on any, well, uh, um, on the, uh, the, the unit recognition program certainly because there's just a lot of factors that go into having a quality program, for example. People, people are looking for the data, understanding the data. There's pieces of that 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 was not a one, that, that's an all. On the SGNA um, Infection Prevention Champions Program, yes, there's one um, infection prevention champion. However, their activities include educating and in-servicing and really being the go-between. So it, it's, it's, um, it is team building because you're all, you're all, again, in this together. And especially with infection prevention, it's like one wrong move and you are on the front page of the paper and that will be the end of you. So everybody really has to get on board with that. And having a champion, and again, you know, inspectors, the, the Joint Commission folks and the inspectors, when they come in, they've been given like a prescribed uh, things to ask and things to look for. And you have to show them how you've raised the bar. Because once they go, well, these people have taken it, uh, you know, an extra step because they feel it's so important to have quality, be it in infection control or prevention, or be it in the fact that they really understand that it, it's important to, um, to understand about adenoma detection rates or operations or efficiency. And they've set themselves up and they measure it and they continue to improve. That will be our last question for today. Thank you for joining us today for this ASGE-sponsored webinar on employee experience in the GI unit. We hope this information is useful to you and your practice. On screen is contact information for ASGE as well as my contact information should you have any questions. Following today's webinar, you will receive a survey. Please take a brief moment to complete it. This concludes our webinar. Have a good day.